Okay, so the next neuroimaging technique I'm going to talk about is one that has been in use, especially clinically, for rather longer than fMRI, and it's, a, it's considered the workhorse of neuroimaging, and it's been tremendously useful. With all of these techniques, each of them is partial. They give you some information, but not other information, so you need to use all three of them to get a more complete picture of how the brain works. The technique I'm going to talk about next is PET, positron emission tomography. And again, it owes a huge amount to physics. And it's useful because unlike fMRI, you can use it to study the brain's chemistry more effectively. So, how does PET work? Well, PET relies on the fact that as well as using oxygen for fuel, neurons, brain cells, use the sugar glucose which is why you feel better when you've had a sweet drink or a um, sugary bar. Okay, so how does this work? The neurons take the glucose into their cell bodies from the passing blood flow and they do two things to it. The first thing is a chemical reaction called phosphorylation and what that does is it adds a chemical group, a molecule of phosphate onto the glucose. It sticks it on, if you like. And that changes the electrical balance of the glucose. Now, glucose in itself is electrically neutral. The charges of all the different atoms balance out. But phosphate is negative. So when you stick a phosphate group on a glucose molecule, it makes the whole thing negative and what that does is it prevent, prevents the glucose from diffusing out of the cell the way it came in. So basically, it's, if you think of this as the cell's lunch, the lunch drifts into the cell and the cell wants to keep it there so it can eat it. So it sticks a phosphate group on it and that kind of bars it from leaving. The second reaction is glycolysis. And that comes from the Greek word to split, lysis. And what that means is that the glucose molecule is split up in a way that releases the energy that the cell can then use to power its machinery. Now, glycolysis splits off a hydroxyl radical, the OH- minus that I was talking about in the context of water. And it splits it off and then the glucose is destroyed and recycled and all the rest of it. So how does PET work? What you want for PET is you want a way of working out how active these neurons are, i.e. how much food they're consuming, but you want something that will get into the cell okay, but will not actually be destroyed until you've actually had a chance to measure it. So what you want to do is you want something that will be phosphorylated okay, but won't be subject to glycolysis straight away. The way they do that is very neat. They use a mimic molecule, and it's called a tracer, tracer molecules. Now, I'm actually only talking about one kind of PET. You can get loads of different tracers to study different kinds of brain chemistry. That's one of the glories of PET, the variety of molecules that, that you can use. This molecule is called fluorodeoxyglucose, FDG, and it's very clever. What happens is that you take a glucose molecule, you take off that hydroxyl, the one that's going to get split off by glycolysis, and instead you put on a fluorine atom. Why? Well, fluorine's about the same size and same weight as the hydroxyl, but it doesn't get broken off by glycolysis. So what you get is that when the tracer, FDG, is put into the blood, gets into the brain, gets into the neurons by diffusion, just like glucose, is phosphorylated, just like glucose, but then the glycolysis can't work because the fluorine's blocking it. So you can then measure, because the fluorine is radioactive, it's a special kind of fluorine, you can then measure the radioactivity in the cell, and that gives you some kind of measure of how much of this stuff is being taken in for food. But, and this is the really neat bit, because the fluorine is radioactive, 
after a while it undergoes radioactive decay. What does it decay into? Oxygen, a type of heavy oxygen, oxygen 18, but chemically it behaves just the way as it would if it were a normal oxygen and that bond can then get broken by glycolysis and so this kind of pet tidies up after itself. So once the radioactive decay has happened, you then get a perfectly normal glucose molecule or near enough as makes no difference to the cell and the cell can go and get its lunch as per normal. When the fluorine decays, this is the positron in positron emission tomography, it emits a positron. That positron leaves. Now, of course, when a positron meets an electron, you get a miniature Big Bang, you get annihilation and they convert into gamma rays. So what happens is that the positron is emitted, the fluorine decays into oxygen, the positron scoots off, it doesn't get far before it hits an electron because there are loads of them floating around, it annihilates and you get two gamma rays in opposite directions and that is what is actually measured in PET. So it's a really neat technique and a very clever way and because these gamma rays are very high energy they're usually quite accurate okay there's a bit of slippage between the point where they're released and the point where they meet the electron but there's not much in it so although PET is rather a slow technique it can't exactly measure the brain in real time not nearly as well as fMRI can but it's a very useful way of looking at brain chemistry and as I said before as well as FDG there are loads of different other clever chemical tricks that you can use to look at what the brain is doing.